Welcome back, everyone. This is The Change Log, and I'm your host, Adam Stachowiak. This is episode 172, and on today's show, we're joined by Pierre Olivier Latour. We dive deep into Pierre's history. We join this call to talk about Git and his new open source project, GitUp, but we had to go so deep in his history to fully appreciate uh, what he's done and where he's going. So we go back to his history at Apple, back to his uh, product he developed called Everpix and went through all of that. And then at the tail end of the show, we start talking deeply about Git, GitUp and Git UX and why you might love, hate Git. We'll see. But we had four awesome sponsors, Codeship, Imagix, DigitalOcean, and Sentry. Sentry is a new sponsor for us. Love those guys. Thank you so much for supporting the show. Our first sponsor is Codeship. Codeship launched a brand new feature called Organizations a few months back. Everyone's been loving it. Now you can create teams. You can set permissions for your specific team members, and you can improve collaboration in your continuous delivery workflows. You can maintain your centralized control over your entire organization's projects and teams with this new feature. It's super awesome. And you can save 20% off any premium plan you choose for three months by using our code, the changelaw podcast. Again, that code is the changelaw podcast. 20% off any plan you choose for three months. Head to codeship.com slash the changelaw to get started. And one more thing I want to tell you about. Sean Devine is doing an API workshop called API First Training. And guess what? He's going to use Codeship as a demo tool. The URL to learn more about that API training is in our show notes. So check those out. But now onto the show. Everyone, we're here today with Pierre Olivier Latour. Uh, Everybody in this entire world knows that I'm not the best with French names, Pierre, but how did I do? You did pretty good. Um, hello, Adam. Thanks for uh, having me with you today. So, Pierre, we've been uh, we've been chatting quite a bit here before we actually started hitting the record button, and I've kind of gotten a little bit familiar with your past, your passion for software development. You got a deep history, um, everything from Apple to companies you've started, from ideas you've had while on vacation to you know, you name it. But what I love to do is sort of start the show off with going deep into your history if we can. But before we do that, can you can you kind of give the audience who may not know who you are uh, a, a brief um, introduction to who you are? Sure, um, I'd be happy to. Um, so like you mentioned, um, I'm actually French. I'm not sure how relevant that is, but I might explain some of my um, accent. And um, I've been doing software development, uh, all aspects of it really from uh, writing code, of course, a lot of that in uh, multiple type of languages, but software development of mobile apps, of desktop apps, of um, server-side code, uh, kernel drivers, like this sort of things. Uh, I've been doing that for almost, for a little more than 15 years now uh, in a, you might say, professional way. And what I mean by that is uh, writing code uh, that is for products that ship to consumers who pay for it, right? Or to an extent, sometimes use it for free. Uh, so I'm not counting little safe projects done on the side, this sort of things. And um, I live in uh, San Francisco, in uh, the Silicon Valley, that is very close. I've uh, been working at uh, some large companies um, in the Valley, some startups. I had my own startups over the year and so on. Um, and yes, my big thing is uh, software in general, um, all aspects of it, which I'm very interested in. And I think when anybody looks at your history and sees this this 15 year of professional software development, as you said, they're going to see names like Apple on it. And Apple obviously turns heads when anybody sees it on their resume. So not to camp out there, but how much further back in your life do we have to go to kind of figure out where you got this itch of software development? Where When did things begin for you to become a software developer? Um I do. So one one important uh, background, I guess, information is I've always been uh, tinkering to an extent um, with, you know, electronics uh, when I was a kid, uh, building uh, radio control airplanes, like all these sort of things. And 
A logical evolution at the time was starting to do things with the personal computer. Uh, my parents had a Mac Classic, uh, which was a very old machine, right? And then I had some um, Atari, which was reasonably popular in France. Um, there was also the Amiga, which was pretty popular at the time. And, you know, what you do on a computer is rapidly you want to create things. And so I played at the time quite a bit with, I think it was HyperCard, and then started learning BASIC, which we had actually at school to an extent. We had some programming lessons already at that time. Uh, we were learning, if I recall correctly, some BASIC, and then we did learn a bit of Pascal. And uh, then I started creating things. And then I started creating uh, software based on ideas, and then... Uh, you know, what I would like to do for me and then started distributing it. And that's how the whole thing started. A lot of the time that was slightly before internet when I, my first software was distributed commercially, it was just borderline where internet was starting to be mainstream and uh, to an extent. And uh, it was still a time where you had to put your sharewares and applications on things called, if I recall correctly, the InfoMark archive, something like that, which was... Um, done by the MIT and, you know, storage was very expensive at the time on servers to store the binaries of the, the apps and so on. So uh, you had all sort of FTP uh, my, uh, mirrors and you had to distribute your software on CDs that came with magazines and lots of hoops to jump through that we don't have to do uh, today anymore, of course. But so this, this is kind of how it started. I just looked up the Mark archive on Wikipedia because I got fast fingers and it says it's a computer-related mailing list archive. Is that uh, does that ring a bell? Yes, yes. That's how at the time, if you were doing uh, not a professional, uh, you know, commercially well, not a professional software distributed by an official publisher in stores and this sort of things, uh, like Photoshop, for instance. Um, but if you were doing sharewares and you wanted to be um, to reach out to people, this was how it was happening. You had to send somehow your uh, compressed file of your little app to that server and with a special text file where you were giving the right to that archive to redistribute your file under certain condition. And then magazines around the world would grab that file if they liked the app and put it on their CDs, which was coming with the magazine. And um, it was, like I said, jumping through hoops, but it was pretty cool because it, you did not have instant gratification like you might have today. It was really deferred. You put your thing in there and then you don't know what's going to happen. And then one day you receive um, a f Japanese magazine, a Mac magazine. You know, I was in France coming all the way from Japan. And because they had put your app on the CD that came with their magazine, um, which is, but it, it might have been two, three months later or who knows. And so this type of deferred gratification was pretty nice at the time. I think uh, your mention of the instant gratification is is certainly a talking point because in today's world, we really are instantly gratified with likes, with tweets, with followers on GitHub, with forks, with issues. There's something, there's like instant feedback loop to whatever we put out there, whether it's the smallest thing to the biggest thing, uh, whether it's professional work or if it's side hobby, fun stuff. Um what was it like to to be in a you know like let's say a slow paced world uh, as a software developer just kind of butting up back then? Huh, that's been uh, you know that's been quite a few years. Um, I think it was <laughs> it teaches you patience. Um, you could not easily update your app. Like today, most apps have, most apps, sorry, are auto updating by definition. It really right. started with the iPhone and then it rolled on a desktop and then apps are self auto updating, even if they're not part of the app store. And this is the way to go. It's obvious for multiple, um, multiple reasons. But at the time you did not really have that. The latency between a new version, the fact people would have it would be significant. And so you had to, I think, pay a lot of attention to the polish of your software and the quality of the code and all of this. Now, at the same time, um, I think the software world was moving slower, which means it was less likely that things would move very fast under your feet, meaning the OS would not be updated as often. Uh, technologies you were relying on would not change as often and so on. Well, today, you know, it's impossible. I think that's one of the challenges with today's development is it's impossible to keep uh, anything constant. So you might have 
you know, I'll use as an example uh, Comic Flow, which is uh, an iPad app I've done um, a few years back, which is still, you know, quite popular today. It's uh, an app to read comics. And um, this is the same code base that was written, I think, five years ago uh, for the original iPad, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the exact same code. And you, the problem is um, when iOS 7 was released, the whole UI changed. And it's not a big deal because your app still works on it. But if you want to fix one little bug because there was suddenly a change in behavior in the OS and your app, even if it works almost the same, there's a little thing you need to fix. Well, now you need to take your app and build it against the latest SDK. You have no choice. Otherwise, Apple does not accept your app into the App Store. So suddenly you have to build your app against iOS 7, even though it was built originally and designed around iOS 5. And just the act of building it will expose a bunch of things that will break because they've changed the name of functions, they've changed the behavior of things, they've changed how the UI works, a bunch of... And so what would have turned into fixing, and I'm not necessarily exaggerating, a single line of code is now a whole project of changing your app. And the thing is, you don't have a choice because if you don't do that, then your app is a little bit broken. So things are changing under your feet. And I would say it's even worse uh, in a way on the server side of things because you can write a beautiful piece of you know, server code that is fully self-contained, very clean and so on. But guess what? Um, now it's written in Python, a new version of Python comes out. You might say, well, that's okay. I'm going to stay on the old one. But then your whole software stack, which is on Amazon, is running, obviously, their own you know, servers and they have their own security rules and policies. And they say, well, guess what? You cannot run that version of our OS anymore because it has security issues and we need to update. And now it's been X number of months. We're going to force update all the machines. The version of Python you're relying on has to be updated as part of that. And so you haven't changed anything on your side, but things have changed underneath you and then suddenly a bug appears while there was none before. And so, uh, you know, it's um, it's a bit like Sisyph in a, in a way, right? You keep pushing yeah. that 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 um, boulder above the mountain and it falls and then you have to do it again and again and again. Um, it was nice, I think, at that time because the pace was much slower and when you were writing something, you were pretty confident it would stay the same for, you know, a couple years more and so on. Um, it was a different different time. Now, obviously, today's time comes with its own set of advantages. It's not all um, negative, of course. You said you're a Frenchman, so... Mm -hmm. Um, and you said that, uh, you know, back in this day, let's, let's sort of not just paint the history, let's sort of paint some timelines. Uh, you said when the internet began, when did the internet begin for you? Yeah, that's a completely fair question because it was very different in Europe and in, uh, in the U S. Um, internet to me began when I guess, I, I cannot recall how it happened, why it happened, but we did buy a modem, um, which at the time was probably 25 kilobits per, per second or something ridiculous like that. And uh, it was pretty expensive because you had to pay on the phone lines. Um, and that's how, that's how it all start. I started using um, internet. Yes. The, what year was um, that, roughly? You know... Um, um, I'm thinking personally it might be like 95, 97, but I'm yes, totally that's guessing. what I would say. That's what I would say. Um, my gut because you're around my age. I'm, I'm 36, so I think you're mm -hmm. roughly the same age. Right? Yeah, I'm 35, same thing. Okay. and I would say for me in France, it was around 95, 96. Yes, that's the best guess I can do. Now I did go to the US uh, a number of times when I was a kid, and then later on. And in the summer of 97 or 96, I was in the U.S. And yes, you could see, I mean, uh, going to, to a summer school there and uh, the school slash university was very well connected on the Internet and so on, more than what I had access to um, in France. Now, France, you may be aware of, had this whole thing, um, which was kind of pre-Internet, before Internet, right? They called the Minitel, uh, which was a computer networked. Uh, on top of the phone system with little computers that a lot of French households uh, were having with a little keyboard and kind of a text-based display, but able to do graphics and whatnot. And that lasted, if I'm not mistaken, that was the 80s um, to early 90s. And then it disappeared when internet happened. And it was, uh, but it was uh, definitely um, omnipresent in the, in the French household. And it was the, yeah, a distributed network of 
network terminals. Um, it was surprisingly uh, ahead of its time in a, way, in a way, but way more limited than internet because it did not have the big thing that um, the hypertext was and HTML and all of this. Um, but so our home did not have that, however, uh, one of the few homes that did not have the system. Um, so, but we did get a modem and all of this later on. So for those who may be uh, fellow Frenchmen listening, they may go back in history and think a little bit, man, when did uh, Minitel kind of end or, you know, what was the state of it? And in 2009, based on Wikipedia, because I got, again, fast fingers here. Uh, still served roughly 10 million monthly connections back in 2009, but ultimately in June of 2012, they decided to, to retire the service. So, Yes, and the unit, as you mentioned it, you know, 10 million monthly connection is for a population of uh, 70 million people, close to that now, which is probably around 25, 30 million um, households. Uh, is is extremely little uh, at its wow. peak. I'm sure it was quite more in this. Um, it was really um, present in the vast majority of, of households. It was uh, very interesting. So we mentioned roughly the time frame of mm -hmm. when the internet began for you, 95, 97, somewhere in that time frame there. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned getting a professional app, which you describe as as uh, somewhat, something that someone buys. Mm -hmm. Um you mentioned delivering something pretty early. I think you even said your childhood, if I remember correctly. What was the first thing you built? What was delivering it like? What was what was the app? I'm not sure I, I recall. Um, this, is, uh, this is a while back, right? We're touching 20 years ago. Right. Um, We're definitely tapping into the, into the deep brain here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it would have been utilities like little things, little apps that would do one single function. And I'm trying to remember, I think one of them was to do patterns uh, that you would use as to edit patterns or combine them, I don't remember exactly, um, that you would set at as a desktop backgrounds. Now, um, it may sound strange today, but um, on computers at the time, they had very limited video memory and regular memory, as a matter of fact. And so you weren't going to use a full image for your desktop background. You were going to use uh, a small pattern that you would simply repeat. There wouldn't have been enough memory to necessarily store the entire uh, a photo, for instance, filling the entire screen. Or if it would have been possible, then you would have used too much memory anyway to leave um, enough available for the other apps and this sort of things. So I, I remember working on something like that. And one of these utilities being the first app I would, I would send to this archive of software. And then that ended up on various CDs and all of that. Well, that's interesting too. The coming back to the CDs aspect, you mentioned being in France, getting an, uh, a magazine from Japan or something like that, and it having your uh, your software on it. And how did they deliver it? What was well? I guess what was interesting about that was it like was it like um, having a book published? Was it like the momentum? But to moment an extent, I think it's a, it's a fine analogy. Um, it's the type of gratification is very different. Uh, like today, they are millions of developers um, on all sort of technology stacks. Um, the most easy to use, widely used tech stack is obviously the web tech stack, right? And you can do a website, an interactive website, and then that's it, it's online. Anyone in the world can go see it, it's, it's instant. Um, it's very different from at the time, suddenly writing a piece of software, um, uploading it super slowly to the FTP server uh, or a mirror of it somewhere in the US on the MIT when you're in France and and then crossing your finger, uh, putting your little text file with it, describing the, ha the app, describing the uh, some sort of license, something like that, just to say, you know, what were the conditions um, under which you allow it through distribution on CDs and things like that. And I, th I think I might have put something along the lines of, please send me a magazine at this address if you distribute it. Uh, but some magazines would do it anyway. Um, and, and then just wait and cross your finger and hope. But at this point, you know, I'm not sure anyone at the time, I can't say for sure, but I would be skeptical that a lot of people would necessarily go into the archive and, and just browse. Uh, the way we we got apps was through these CDs or before the CDs because it needs to go further than that. Um, they were coming with little floppy disks, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, not flo uh, I mean the three point five, the small disk. 
Um, I'm looking for the, the exact term in English, but the uh, not the floppy ones, the smaller version, right? And, um, you know, it was exciting. It's like you get your magazine once a month, and then what apps am I going to get with it? And type of freewares and sharewares and all of this, and they have to be very small because they have to fit on uh, um, 1.5 megabytes or whatever it was, or less than 2 megabytes uh, for a number of these little apps. So that was pretty exciting. It, you are correct using the analogy that it was equivalent to being published. And then later on you had, um, I think it was download, well, CNET something and then download.com started to be uh, the places where you had to be uh, to, uh, I, I'm, I just want to be clear, by the way, that I'm talking about the Mac side of things, right? Um, right. I cannot speak for the experience of publishing uh, distributing software on the Windows platform or Amiga or Atari or any of these. Yeah, I'm glad you made that uh, mention because I was going to ask you about that because it seems like you said the very first computer that your parents had was a, uh, an Apple Basic, right? Um, uh, Mac Classic. Mac yes. Classic, sorry. Apple yes, yes. Basic. Well, we had Mac an Classic. Apple II, actually, to be correct. We okay. did have an Apple II, um, and and I mean, I have photos of me as a, as a toddler and like next to the Apple II and this sort of things. Wow. But, so that's how I kind of recall. Um, but but we did have a Mac Classic later on. And I guess we, we were from the start an Apple house in a way. And then when Apple was kind of losing some steam, um, for some reason we had an Atari and then went back into the Mac later on. And just for the English speaking out there mm -hmm. who don't have an accent and no poking funds whatsoever, All right. I think you're saying Atari. Yes, yes. Okay, um, just, just making sure. Atari, yes. And uh, it was a big deal in France, along with uh, Amiga. I love the Atari. Big, um, I mean, who didn't love the Atari, right? I mean, that was, <laughs> that's, that's, when, yeah. that's when, like, the light bulbs went off for so many mm -hmm. people. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, Pierre, let's, let's pause there for a minute. Since we talked about Apple, I do want to dive a bit into your Apple history. But mm -hmm. let's take a quick sponsor break. We'll come back and we'll talk about... Apple for you and some things you you've uh, did in the Apple space and, and continue to do, obviously, but uh, we'll be right back. Imagix is a real time image processing proxy in CDN. And let me tell you, this is way more than image magic running on EC2. This is way better. It's everything your friend and developers have dreamt of output to PNG, JPEG, GIF, JPEG 2000 and several other formats. And if you're like me, you've ever argued with your boss or a teammate about serving retina images to non-retina devices, you'll appreciate their open source dependency free JavaScript library that allows you to easily use the ImageX API to make your images responsive to any device. Now all of this takes a platform and the ImageX platform is built on three core values, flexibility and quality, performance and affordability. When it comes to flexibility and quality, Imagix has over 90 URL parameters that you can mix and match to provide an unlimited amount of transformations that you need for your images. And they take quality very seriously. And because of their commitment to quality, several top 1000 websites in the world trust them to serve their images. Now, when it comes to performance, Imagix operates out of data centers filled with top of the line Mac Pros and Mac Minis and they're set up for a completely streaming solution. This means your images never hit the disk. Images are served by the best SSD-based CDN for delivery around the world anywhere extremely fast. And while we're talking about speed, almost all the image processing happens on GPUs. This means transformations are super fast when compared to competing virtualized environments. And lastly, it's all about affordability. Everyone wants to save a buck. That's how the world works. Because Imagix processes close to a billion with a B images per day, they're able to make certain optimizations at scale and pass those savings on to you. To learn more about Imagix and what they're all about, head to imgix.com slash changelog. Once again, imgix.com slash changelog and tell them Adam from the changelog sent you. All right, we're back with Pierre Olivier Latour, a uh, an awesome French software developer with a deep passion for some really cool stuff. And Pierre, you said your household, your mom and your dad, yourself were Apple. You got a picture of yourself next to uh, an Apple, uh, a Mac Classic. 
um, or it was an Apple II. It was an Apple, Apple II. II. Yeah. Apple II. So, I yeah. mean, Way not, back. as a toddler, not too many people mm-hmm. have mm-hmm. that kind of history with, with computers or even software development. So you kind of go really, really f- far back. And uh, uh, if anyone scans your history and learns a bit about you, one of the things they sort of uh, notice pretty early on is that uh, you're an Apple guy, of course, but that mm-hmm. you also had uh, the joy of selling a company or a product. I'm not sure how you really phrase that to Apple, which mm-hmm. ultimately became Quartz Composer. Can you can you speak to that a little bit? Um, yes, yes, um, I certainly can. Um, I think it's important to have a, a little bit of um, history for the context. Um, the while I was so I've always done. Um, as you mentioned, a number of software projects, some of them personal, some of them commercial. And um, towards the end of um, university, I guess you would say that, I was going to an engineering school in Switzerland at the time. Um, I was working on um, a video game startup that I co-founded with uh, a few other people, uh, mostly a lot of graphic designers, as a matter of fact. I think we were six graphic designers and a couple of programmers, and uh, plus marketing and the sort of things. And so we worked more than two years on a video game that, that we um, published and distributed in Europe and all of this. And um, it was actually a real-time 3D video game. And that was the result of me starting to experiment a couple of years before with the real-time 3D graphic chips that were starting to appear on the Mac. And so you might remember at the time companies like 3DFX, which were yeah. starting to build these uh, this cards. You could plug into your PC and suddenly you were able to do 3D rendering in real time, uh, incredibly faster than doing it on a CPU, of course. Um, and uh, well, on the Mac, you know, it took a long time before 3DFX was compatible with the right drivers and whatnot, but um, there was definitely um, ATI chips starting to appear on some of the laptops and so on. And there was what was called uh, quick draw 3D at the time. And um, and some games starting to appear real time as uh, 3D, etc. And to me, that was a very interesting field. Um, how you you actually create 3D graphics on a computer. And uh, so I started learning a lot about this and doing wireframe rendering and all software rendering. Then starting to learn how to to uh, write um, real time 3D rendering, but using the low level drivers um, of the um, hardware acceleration cards, video cards. And all of that led one thing to another and starting to build a game and having people join, et cetera, et cetera. And so one of the things I did um, during these two years was obviously gain quite a bit of experience of building real-time 3D graphics. And um, one field I was always interested in, uh, another field, I guess, was you know, just real-time graphics in general and music visualization and just creativity. And I just wanted to um, experiment with that and poking around and what you could do and how you would create motion graphics in a more intuitive way. And there were a number of products, obviously, in this field at the time, but they were all, uh, to start with, um, having two fundamental limitations, I would say. The first one is uh, was a user experience limitation, where they were just very complicated to use or um, felt not approachable at all. Um, you know, like this type of clunky, very technical UI and so on. And the second very important limitation is they were all software. And so the rendering was, as you can imagine, very slow or it had to be small windows and so on. And um, I'm talking on the Mac platform, but the PC platform was not much better. Um, and um, so I started building prototypes of... A 3D uh, motion, uh, sorry, a hardware accelerated motion graphics engine that was very, very uh, flexible based on OpenGL at the time. And uh, it was highly modular combined with an interface that was node based where you connect, you know, nodes, each node doing a single function and this sort of things. And then writing a hundred or so of these nodes and starting to have interesting creations. And that was called Pixel Shocks. And it was Um, distributed as a public beta, it had a website, it had a community, uh, motion graphic artists, you know, artists in general, uh, people doing installation, people in the video industry, uh, people doing um, animated graphics during um, shows, uh, DJs, this sort of of events. So a a niche community, you could say, but uh, very interested and active around such a product that that was really... um, uh, unique at the time and enabled a lot of creativity and freedom in creativity. And somehow this this um, got up to 
the attention of uh, various people at Apple in graphics and imaging and all this sort of things. And it happened that at the time I was lucky to be doing my um, master's thesis at um, at Stanford, which is about a 10 minutes drive away from uh, the Apple campus in Cupertino. And so I met with the, you know, various um, directors, executives, and so on at Apple, and then they were really, really interested in, in this tech, and um, and they ended up uh, acquiring the uh, all the technologies, the IP, and all of these things, and I joined Apple, and then I built a team there, and that product became uh, Quartz Composer, which was the, and still to an extent, the, the standard way of doing motion graphics on OS X, so it, the technology was distributed with, I think, well, every Mac since um 104 uh which OS 10 104 i mean which was in 2004 if i recall correctly and um yeah all over the place wherever you needed motion graphics on OS 10 if it's simple things like screensavers to to iTunes visualizers to all the effects in in iMovie in um in iPhoto in uh, i mean the original time machine uh, some of the apple the apple tv the the, the version 1 uh, was running it for a number of the animations. The um, uh, the Apple Stores reservation system at the time, like all the animation with the queue, that stuff was running it. Um, really like Final Cut Pro, uh, Motion, like a bunch of places were leveraging its power um, and big clients of it were internally the HI team, which is the human interface team. And they were using that as a replacement for director, micrometer director, because it let them be... Um, a lot more creative and, and do things in real time. And um, so a lot of the prototyping for the um, uh, use OS X user interface was done on Quartz Composer, a lot of the prototyping for uh, the iPad, you know, the iPhone, like this sort of things. And um, and then today, even today, you know, companies like Facebook still use it extensively for prototyping and creating um, interactive mocks of of, um, of their products as well as uh, IDEO to an extent and so on. So it, it ended up being used, you know, really all over the place. Um, the, the most um, funny or original, I should say, example I heard of its use was um, after the iPhone launch and official uh, presentation by Steve Jobs. Um, the director of the graphics and imaging group came to me and said, um, "Oh, I learned that the the whole display system to you know display the iPhone on a gigantic screen on stage and all of that was actually built on um, Quartz mm-hmm. Composer, which I thought was cool. Uh, obviously, I wasn't in the know of the time for this sort of things, nor um, did I have to be disclosed on this. But I thought it was kind of neat that it was also used for that. It's so interesting to hear this kind of history. I think that." One of the things I love doing about this show is that, you know, just to paint uh, a little bit of the future of this show we're doing here today is, you know, we're having you on here to talk about GitHub, which uh, we'll get into much deeper later. But as I started to dig into who you are, I was like, wow, this guy's got a lot of history in software development. And and you are at Apple in a pivotal time for the company, which was when they launched the iPhone. And that was in like mm-hmm. what? I think it was 2008 or was it 2007? It wasn't yes, 2007. Yes, I think was it was it? announced in 2007. I don't remember exactly. Um, yeah, like how, it was at long. least teased. It wasn't yeah. released. I think yes. it was 2008 yes. it was released. Yeah, there, were, there was a gap of a few months uh, before the announcement and then the official release. Uh, six months, maybe I don't. I don't recall exactly. Yeah, it was. It was certainly a very interesting time. It was a great time to be at Apple. It was. After I joined in, um, I think it was June 2003. So. After the turnover had started, uh, jo- uh, Steve Jobs had joined a few years before. He had done already the iMac and then the iPod and consolidated the product lines. And he was starting to get, you know, the, the seeds were in place. Um, but it obviously significantly accelerated later on with um, the iPhone and the App Store and everything else that came along. Um, it was, yes, a very, very interesting time because Apple was not too big. I think when I was there, it was about 14,000 employees total. Now it's it's probably 30, 40,000. I mean, don't quote me on that, but I think these are the numbers. Right. Uh, a lot of salespeople. That was when I joined, it was just before the Apple Store, if I'm not mistaken, or barely. Um, so now Apple has a ton of salespeople, um, huge yeah. workforce, uh, much larger engineering teams and all of that. But, you know, it's... Um, the department I was at, graphics and imaging, was actually very small. It was 
about 50 people and um, minus, you know, uh, the people who, who are managers, even though engineering managers, um, like I was, were definitely coding a lot, not just managing, but still um, not coding as much, shall we say. Um, a few, you know, a couple of QA people, um, administrative assistant and so on. So maybe 45 effective engineers. And, and that small team was responsible for all graphics and imaging on the OS, excluding uh, QuickTime, which was a separate team. And that means um, all the 2D graphics, so that means Quartz, um, all and PDF, all of that. That means all the hardware acceleration, uh, all the Windows server, all the 3D graphics, um, all the color management system, all the image capture, all the printing, uh, you know, everything that touch pixels. And so That's very so crazy, small team. Man, that, yeah, that I mean, the such Apple, a hand in their history. it's, yes, it's, it's unheard of. And um, in terms of productivity, right? And Apple was, um, I can't comment on how, how true that still is, um, having been out of the loop for some time. But Apple was um, exceptional in terms of, and a software engineering division, in terms of productivity per engineer. Um, it was, the results were there. So these are facts, right? You look at the number of engineers, you look at the at the output and the quality of the output and the creativity and all of this. The uh, To give you an example, my, my um, couple example, my immediate neighbor, um, uh, office space wise, was the uh, creator of Core Animation, right? Which um, was, the foundation for uh, UI Kit, which was the foundation for the whole UI for the phone, and it would not have existed without it, right? And it's that's it. That's one person, extremely talented, of course. Uh, my other neighbor was the the uh, the engineer behind Core Video, um, and again, which was a foundation for. Uh, all the video tech, all the modern video pipeline that was done on OS X and the phone and all the QuickTime 10 and all of these things, absolutely critical. Um, he was also the, writing a number of drivers uh, secretly for um, OS X running on Windows boxes. It was um, a different story. And so it's, it's just that. It's just like you walk 10, foot, 10 feet and you're in the office of the person who writes you know, like the two people who write the entire um, Quartz uh, engine for 2D rendering on OS X. And that's it. It's things like that. So the the, the magnification um, is, the leverage magnification was just insane um, between people and output and uh, the ability to learn and so on. So that was a very, that was a really good place to be at this department specifically because graphics are everywhere. So we were having prototypes, one of the rare groups uh, at Apple to have access to a lot of prototypes because, you know, a new Mac comes out. Well, guess what? It comes with a new um, hardware video card. That's pretty much always the case. And so, well, guess what? New drivers, things to test and all of this. So we would have access to them. Um, or when the camera was, um, eyesight was added to, to Macs, like all these sort of things, then you have to build things for that. And guess what? It's graphics. When you have uh, new apps, if it's a new iPhoto or a new iMovie, well, guess what? They leverage a lot, like Quartz Composer and any other text. And so you need, you're disclosed because you need to work with them. Um, so that was a, a great place to be exposed to a gazillion things that were going on and also learn because um, I was one of the, the youngest in that um, team at the time, and a number of people were coming from Next uh, and were definitely veteran of the industry, right? Another neighbor of mine was um, the creator of Painter, for example. Um, you know, that, that, that very big painting app, um, like about 10 years ago or so, 10, 15 years ago um, on, on the Mac and then PC. Um, so it's like you were tapping into a body of knowledge that was just phenomenal in terms of ability to learn. And it's very, um, um, it was very unique on a number of levels. And I have not seen that to this extent um, at other places afterwards in my, in my career. And I don't know if that's still the case at Apple today because, you know, people move on and then now it's much bigger, a lot more engineers. Uh, the recruiting bar might have been lowered because, you know, there is no miracle. If you want to hire a thousand engineers, you can't be as selective as if you want to hire a hundred. Yeah. This Always. sort of things. When you say painter, do you mean Corel painter? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, before it was bought by Corel, if I remember okay. correctly. I think it's just interesting to, to see that... Um, 
you know, a, a budding software developer decides to to really get interested in 2D and 3D graphics, uh, tinkers, as you said before, and I know that uh, uh, tinkery means a lot of things to, to a lot of people, but ultimately you created Pixel Shocks, which was renamed to Quartz Composer, and then you have this history at Apple in one of the most pivotal moments of their history. And, and I'm assuming, only just based on what I see of your resume, that it could have been a pivotal moment in your history as well. Um, but I think why I say that is that there's so many listeners out there thinking, well, here I am tinkering on X, Y, and Z. You know, here's something I'm interested in, whether, whatever it might be. And to see your life and the way that your career has, has played out and who you worked for because of just some true passion and some true interest and you, and you followed it and ultimately it got you to the places mm-hmm. you've been in that time period. I think it's just, so interesting and so also so inspirational to those out there who are like, I'm tinkering on this little thing here. It's probably nothing. And it, and it's a big deal. It could be a big deal. It could be a big deal, but we all have to be, uh, to be honest here. Um, commitment is of the utmost important or importance. And, um, you know, I think we all start by tinkering on things, uh, and software, um, programming is especially, fit for this. It's a lot easier to tinker and experiment, obviously, in a non-tangible world than trying to do that in hardware. And so that that enables a lot of creativity and there's pretty much no cost uh, in terms of money uh, if you if you scrap, um, scrap a project, right, and cancel it or this sort of things, um, contrary to hardware again. But, you know, you have to keep doing it and all the way and, and like, bring the project uh, to completion and then ship it and then get it to users and so on and so on. Um, Bill Shell Shocks was, um, well, discovered um, by Apple to an extent, right? Because it was public at the time and, and, and it was functional and it was, um, it was a piece of technology, truly. It was not uh, a few things put together like that. There was an engine layer and there was an editing layer and there was clean separations the way it was built and a bunch of things that I had learned through the years. And of course, after I joined Apple, I rewrote the whole thing. I think it was twice at least <laughs> um, because you learn a lot more and you're like, oh, it's suddenly it's a big deal. It's a system technology. It's right. going to ship as part of every freaking machine uh, that Apple ships. So... You have to be careful when you were um, opening your Mac for the very first time and you boot it the very first time. There's this thing that appears that's called Mac Buddy, which is that setup assistant. And the very first animation Mac Buddy is running Course Composer. Um, I can't say if that's still the case anymore, but it was the case for a number of years, for instance. So you have to make sure your thing works. And when you start having a, techn- a piece of technology that is pervasive um, among all these products, um, well, you know what they say, with great power come great responsibility. So I learned a lot of things there in terms of not what to do uh, when your technology is everywhere and not like modifying this piece of code uh, too fast without being careful, like this sort of things. Um, but the point I was, the, the, the main point I was making is that tinkering and being enthusiastic and all of that is, is, um, is, a, is the start. Um, after that, you do need to follow through and just bring the project to completion. That's very important. Um, yes, that, that to me, that, that's critical because otherwise, you know, the various opportunities I've, I had through the years um, would not have had the, uh, you know, the substrate to, to appear if each product had been like half done or not really functional or not well-defined or this sort of things. It's a ton of work for each of them. Well, this is a good chance to to take another pause. When we come back, I want to talk about Everpix. It's not exactly the next thing, uh, unless uh, for some reason you you would like to talk about the very next thing in your in your lineage, and your in your resume, Cool Iris. Um, I want to jump into some of the things you did at Everpix when we come mm-hmm. back from this break. Is that cool with you? Do you want to go from there, or do you want to talk about Cool Iris a little bit uh, to kind of wrap up some some timeline for yourself? Um, you know, Kudaris was a couple of years after, um, after Apple. Um, I left Apple in 2009. Um, so I worked on the, I built and, and led the course composer team at the time. We did a couple of releases, um, as part of the OS. Then I figured, you know, um, 
I'm pretty happy where things at. Wanted to tackle something new. The iPhone had just been released. Um, the SDK was announced by Steve Jobs out of nowhere. Um, I very few people knew about that at Apple, so it surprised a lot of engineers. It's like, oh, by the way, in six months there's going to be an SDK for people to write native apps with, and so it was kind of scrambled putting engineers together, starting to put that SDK together. And at the time, like I said, it was roughly after, I think, 10.5 had shipped or 10.6, I can't recall exactly. And, um, and, and, and I figured, okay, well, that's a good transition point and the iPhone is going to be big. I should probably do something in that space. And so I joined the iPhone team and um, helped um, with the SDK and all the, the, the media side of things and graphics and whatnot. And, um, and after the SDK release, I ended up... Um, leading and well managing um, a team that did the web technologies uh, and specifically hardware acceleration uh, in the web browser, which was very new at the time and that appeared originally on Safari, on mobile Safari to be precise. And, um, you know, this idea that you can take your your um, HTML divs and blocks and so and so on and animate them and have hardware acceleration for that. So CSS transform, CSS animations, hardware acceleration. And so that was a dedicated team, very senior team. And um, so I managed that team for a year or so, if I recall correctly. I learned a bunch of things about the web. And then I figured, um, okay, it's been six years at Apple, five and a half, something like that. I would like to do something else. And I took a sabbatical joined the school I started for a couple of years. Uh, that's where I started building uh, mobile apps. Um, the one that some of your uh, listeners might have used at the time was called Discover, which uh, got pretty popular. It was um, an interesting way, uh, innovative way of uh, browsing and uh, exploring, really, Wikipedia, um, done for iPad, launched very soon after the iPad was launched. And uh, the main idea there was that um, what if we take the Wikipedia content, which is encyclopedic content, so therefore kind of boring, and make it like a magazine. And a uh, very nice presentation, layout, the whole thing dynamic, and, and it was completely different from any other Wikipedia clients. We were just taking the web pages and possibly styling them a little bit with CSS, and that's it. Um, it was built from scratch and doing a, a number of... Um, interesting things in terms of innovative, in terms of user experience and, and search abilities. And, um, and so, yeah, the app got pretty popular for some time. Um, and so that was a very interesting experience for me. I was in Japan at the time for a couple of years. So I worked uh, with Japanese designer to build this app and they bring a completely different perspective on design, as you can imagine. Oh, yeah. um, I'm sure. Very, very interesting experience. We built some... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the templates, the, the style of the app and so on. Now it would look seriously dated because, you know, it's six, seven years old. Right. And it, doesn't it was a different anymore. aesthetic then. I mean, yes, yes. But honest. on the original iPad, you got to imagine like this yeah. big screen that's tactile. And for the first time, you have something that looks really, really pretty. And uh, Flipboard was launched roughly at the same time. Um, like, I think it was just after or just before. And... Um, and it was, you know, this idea of presenting content on tablets as as magazine, which became uh, quite popular afterwards. That was this app was part of the uh, like Flipboard of really um, kicking the trend, I guess, or was at the right time at the right place to an extent. Um, and so, yeah, I built a few, uh, I mean, a couple iPad apps and some other stuff for Colaris, and um, and then Everpix happened. Yes. Well, cool. Let's let's pause there for just a minute. We're going to touch a bit on Everpix when we come back and dive deep into GitHub, the mm -hmm. uh, the troublesomeness, I guess, of the user experience of using Git from the command line. Uh, but but we'll be we'll be right back. So hang out. I have yet to meet a single person who doesn't love DigitalOcean. If you've tried DigitalOcean, you know how awesome it is. And here at the changelog, everything we have runs on blazing fast SSD cloud servers from DigitalOcean. And I want you to use the code changelog when you sign up today to get a free month, run a server with one gig of RAM and 30 gigs of SSD drive space, totally for free on DigitalOcean. Use the code changelog. Again, that code is changelog. Use that when you sign up for a new account. Head to digitalocean.com to sign up and tell them the changelog sent you. All right, everybody, we're back once again. Uh, Pierre, it's been so much fun having this conversation with you. Obviously, we're here to talk about some of your deeper roots, Everpix being a recent company 
that you started based on an idea that you had while you were on vacation. And I'm glad you mentioned your, uh, your stint in Japan because that sort of led you to some travel and whatnot. And that's where this idea came from when you were on this, on this trip. But also I'd love to dive deep into get up and uh, mm-hmm. what's happening there. So let's, let's talk a bit about Everpix. I mean, what was this idea to you? What was it like? Was this your first company that you built or, I guess kind of, but not really. It wasn't your first. No, company. it was it was the second company. Okay. The, uh, the very first one was uh, that game company. I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, which lasted um, I think about three years um, back in ninety eight or so. And um, yeah, that, that was a completely different type of company, different product by far. Different time uh, frame too. Yes, yes, absolutely. Very, a whole very different, different world. Yeah, and uh, completely. I mean, the other one we did raise some money, but it was not. Um, it, it was it was completely different. Um, Everpix was a true startup, as you would define it in the Silicon Valley, right? Um, in terms of of uh, how it happened, in terms of um, how it was capitalized, in terms of uh, what happened at the end, in a way, um, all these sort of things. So Everpix, um, I, I guess the easiest way to open this one up is is how did it come about? You were on a trip. You were. Mm-hmm. Taking photos, sharing photos. What was the situation? What where did this idea come from? Um, well, you know, like a lot of people when they start projects, and I'm no exception, um, do it because they have a frustration. And Everpix started from that. And um, the frustration was very simple: is um, we were traveling quite a bit while in Asia, and I just wanted to have all my photos in one place um, on the cloud, obviously, and having a really good way to browse them and and share them. And, you know, really basic, basic stuff. And I figured I tried all the service at the time. That's back in 2011. Uh, So obviously the big ones like Flickr and two uh, more esoteric ones. And they were not working, period. Um, If you wanted to have your photo collection online and it would work magically, to use that overloaded term, then there was truly nothing. Everything was a massive pain. Everything had to be done by hand, one photo at a time, like all these sort of things. And um, figured, okay, well, in 2011, with the technology we have and the powerful computer we have, we can do much, much better than this. And so the first thing I wrote was really uh, um, an efficient syncing system between iPhoto and, I mean, Aperture, I was using Aperture at the time, and the cloud. And... um, you know, even things um, that little utilities that were attempting to do this at the time with to send all your iPhoto library to Flickr or things like that, um, they were far from doing it as efficiently as as the approach I had taken. Like, for instance, I was doing some reverse engineering of the iPhoto and Aperture databases to directly grab everything efficiently rather than requiring people to kind of export to the XML and all of this. And it was a lot more reliable and transparent. And... Um, and so a simple problem that you solve, right? And and um, what happened is I figured, okay, well, that's pretty cool. I, I want to keep going with that. And then Kevin Connison, who I knew from my time at Apple because he was on the course, course Composer team, um, turned out to be um, not only uh, brilliant in terms of uh, image analysis and software engineering and all of that, but also be pretty interested in this problem. And then uh, I searched for a designer and I met um, Wen Fan, who was at a turning point in his career in a way and looking for a next opportunity. And so the three of us who were pretty interesting in that, interested in this space and decided to, you know, iterate and start building something more advanced. And that's where, like when I said earlier, it's it's a typical, in a way, Silicon Valley startup is that then um, we we applied to TechCrunch Disrupt, which is one of the big events to, to uh, big startup competitions, right? And... Um, uh, to our surprise, in a way, we got selected. And um, so they have hundreds and hundreds, if not a thousand, I don't even remember, startups applying. And this, they pick like 10 or 11. And, um, so for hundreds the and hundreds, round. and they pick 10 or 11. Yeah, it's it's even more than that. But and you that know was why you goes. were surprised, it's, not because you were really awesome, but because there were so well, many. Well, you know, we were, we were very early. And yes, and there were so many. And, and we were kind of rushing to do the application. And, um, and in, in any case... Uh, it was selected, which definitely gave us a boost, and we completed the company and rushed uh, before the, the doing the um, before the event to make sure everything was aligned and transfer the IP and all of this, and uh, raised a little bit of money, um, and um, and then from there, you know, we 
were able to present it, start getting attention, raise more money, iterate, learn a lot, and so on and so on. And to not dive too deep into the story, um, the startup lasted a couple of years and a half, and it not it's not a pivot, but it we all gained a ton of understanding and about the photo space from a consumer perspective. Um, I would say a lot more than than the competition at the time, and we realized that there was a lot more than just a syncing problem and having the same photos everywhere on all your devices. That was actually just a prerequisite to tapping and addressing the real problem. And the real problem, as we discovered it, was what we later called the, the photo mess. And this idea that um, people have tens of thousands of photos. Now, at least 10,000 is close to that. That was the matrix at the time. And, you know, suddenly they're all over the place among your computers and mobile phones, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not, it's, they're a mess because the, people don't organize them anymore. And you can't blame them for that. You can't yeah, organize photos. There's too many photos out there. I mean, I, right. it, it doesn't I mean, my, work. My and, iPhone has 16,000 photos on it. I don't organize those things. Right. And it's not, um, but so, so it is a mess. And if you I like that say, term, well, by the way. sorry. I like that term, by the way, photo mess. Yes. Well, it took a long time to to um, to uh, figure out that term. We had to to work with a it seems um, so natural, honestly. A pretty a pretty talented uh, marketing slash positioning expert for that. And um, uh, to really put, because to you as a founder, it's clear what you're trying to do, but you have to convey these concepts to not only the consumers but the investors. And um, they have all sort of patterns and and, and uh, bias and whatnot. So it's very important to position your product properly. And um, in any case, the you know a lot of startup, uh, pretty much all startups, they were just looking at the surface and say, well, okay, it's a mess. We all get that. Let's put everything together in one place. But now you have one mess instead of multiple messes, and it, you haven't solved anything. And so the photo mess to us was more than that. Is it was the lost opportunity of having this incredibly valuable uh, treasure of emotion that connects to you personally because it's your photo life to a degree that nothing else can touch and not Facebook and your your friend status and post and photo. No, it's your life. And having that scattered and, and out of reach on all these devices and whatnot and not connected to you anymore. And so the big thing that Everpix focused on is having a very, very advanced technological stack uh, in terms of image compression, in terms of uh, syncing, in terms of image analysis and uh, semantic understanding of the content of photos and things that were really advanced at the time. And But that's all tech. And so what you do with that is that lets you have very efficiently the entire live photo collection of each user in the cloud. And that lets you understand what it is made of uh, to a degree like these are photos of this you know these are photos of people these are photos of trees these are photos taken in cities like all of that based on image analysis uh, not even metadata so a lot more powerful and uh, combined with um, insanely accurate deduplication algorithm uh, so that you never see twice the same photo independently of recompression artifacts and color uh, shifts in uh, due to color space changes between facebook and the original photo and all of that but what you do with that is you now have this unified live photo collection and you can understand you can understand it and you use that knowledge to uh, surface the photos back to the user and this is where the, the the power and the this is where it clicked for people and this is why everpix had such a high rate uh, of subscription um, typical freemium products are happy when they get you know three four percent of conversion we had 12 so vastly out there. Right. Um, Three times. And, and yeah, so that's why the, the, the product definitely was a hit with a, a category of the market. And um, because suddenly you had all this photo life uh, being connected. I mean, it's not exactly the best term because it's not technical, but it's uh, you are recreating these emotions when people see again their photos. And you can only do that if you present the right photos and you have the entire life photo collection, et cetera, et cetera. So the technology stack you need to have underneath to achieve this simple result is is massive. And it took us you know, a year and a half to build everything um, to the scale that it could handle what we were building because we had the life photo collection of each user. And that was unique at the time. Um, the average user had you know, 10,000 photos, like I said. That is massive. So Everpix, when it, you know, shut down at the end, had 400 million full-resolution photos. Um, we were having peaks um, mm. 
uh, at, at, I think it was eight million photos a day, like regularly, things like that. And to give you an idea, like Flickr was getting at the same time around four million photos a day, according to their, their um, own numbers. So, you know, a small team of like six engineers was handling a huge amount of photos combined with um, state-of-the-art uh, semantic analysis running on like, I think, 80, 100 servers. I mean, massive stuff uh, to build that. And, and, uh, and it did resonate very, very well with a category of the market. Um, the trick thing, uh, the tricky thing is that it is a highly, highly competitive space where success is measured in millions of users and um, especially, which you can only attend if you have virality. If you look at, if you think photo space, people are gonna immediately say photo sharing and they're gonna immediately so gonna say Instagram and whatnot. And Aeropix was absolutely not a photo sharing. I mean, you could share photos by definition, but it was not a social photo sharing app system. It was very personal. So it's a, it's a different thing, but you get um, pulled in with the same in the same bucket as a bunch of other startups. And so highly competitive, the bar is very high and so on. And it was very difficult for us to convince investors that we were onto something that would go really, really big because they would say, well, yeah, all your metrics are incredibly impressive, except one, which is the total number of users. And, and while some little photo app might have like a million active users, we had like 50,000 something uh, registration and signups and all of this. and um, even if all the reviews were uh, really, really good on the App Store, like all over the place, and people absolutely love the product and the press, and we got an, a really high amount of press coverage, as a matter of fact, and um, it was it was just not enough to alleviate the concern of of large investors when you're at the Series A stage, where you typically raise like at least five millions, and um, and we are raised by then like two point five million, but you know, the money was, was gone. It was spent on, on payroll, on infrastructure and all of these things. And uh, so every piece was kind of cut short and we would never know if it would have um, become something very, very big or it would have kind of stalled at, I don't know, 100,000 users or something like that because it never really had a chance to um, really fly after it was built. The product was, I mean, the company had to shut down about six months, eight months at most after, you know, 1.0 was really released. And, uh, and things are starting to pick to pick up. If you, um, you, you know, a lot of the data, pretty much all the data related to the startup um, was released as open source uh, data on GitHub. You can just look for Everpix Intelligence. That's the name of the repository. And it's all in there. Like every freaking data set, uh, reports, like it just, I had to, to redact a few little things for um obvious um, reasons that there is no data whatsoever from the users, as you can imagine. Uh, but there is things like the raw feedback from all the famous investors and VCs in the Valley, except I don't give the names, but it's all in there unedited. Wow. The, uh, all our metrics, all the, um, all, all the data, like a, a ton of data. And um, because nobody had done that before, like to that extent, like no startup not making it had, had released all the data raw unedited for people to make their own opinion and look at it and so at the time in the startup world like when i did that i think it was very early 2013 um it was um yeah it, it was very very uh popular in the startup world and discussed because like i said it had not happened before to see suddenly inside um having such an inside view of all the all the data and before there had been a, a very uh, good and and well written article and pretty much unbiased on on what happened with Everpix on the verge and um uh, which was actually um the the writers and journalists were a fan of our product and um you know telling the story in a very interesting way talking to the various actors the vcs and all of that and that was also an, an article that got very very popular in the startup world because it was an inside look at what exactly happens when when a startup fails like how do you get there where you get so good reviews from your users and you raise that money and you get great investors and this and that and and then suddenly it's like well it's not gonna work well, you know we have to shut down in two months because we run out of cash and um so that was that was definitely a very interesting experience the team was very happy with the product and all the insight we get on the photo space and you know um if you look at google photo for instance today it's it is extremely close 
to, to whatever Pix was at the time. And of course, they do a number of things better, and we had the things we were doing better. But um, it, is, it is very, very close, a number of concepts. You know, the um, Dropbox, um, one of our, our key features was called Flashbacks, and Dropbox a year later called, released a feature that is the same thing and called Flashback <laughs> uh, after every Pix shut down. Um, we released what was called the uh, same feature, right? What was called inside, um, sorry, Highlights. It took us some time to find the term and everything. This idea of using the uh, all our um, semantic analysis of the photos to provide a summary of your photo life and so that you can navigate very fast and then dive in. And it was all dynamic in the in the iOS app and it's things flying around in a very intuitive way. And, you know, three months later, it was like Google Photo came up with what was called Highlight and they define it as finding the most representative photos, uh, which was exactly the same thing. Uh, it was pretty funny. And um, same definition, same word, uh, three, four months later, whenever that was, when they announced Google Photos. So we were definitely like... Um, On the right um, track. Yeah, yeah. And a number of things. Like we're the first one to recompress photos. And all the VCs were freaking out. Um, like, you can't do that. People are, are, are not going to understand that. And because we are our own image compression technology that let us do 5x, close 4 to 5x settings in terms of space at uh, the same quality perceptually, right, on screen. And so a photo that used to be one megabyte was now uh, on average 200, ki um, 200 um, sorry, kilobytes. And these are massive settings in sort of storage costs hey, so and the, bandwidth. So the size again, you said one megabyte? Five, you know, four to five X settings. Okay. At, at full resolution, um, the full resolution and, and, and uh, you know, complete color correctness, everything. And you had to really look at more than 100% to see the differences on the edges and so on. Because, you know, this is one of the other things we did. We said, well, photos are taken in JPEG. JPEG is a very old technology based on, you know, fast Fourier transform and all these things and goes back like dozens of years. And we can do much, much better today. So we build everything on top of a uh, variant of JPEG 2000 and wavelets and all custom conversion pipeline, all these things. And the results you know, spoke for themselves. We had the fastest thinking by a factor of four to five X compared to the competition and our storage costs were four to five X lower. I mean, like I said, we have 400 million full res photos. It's insane. And, and for a very reasonable storage cost. And, um, but at the time people were very concerned about this, but the truth is none of the users cared because we didn't hiding it at all. We we're saying, you know, we're optimizing the photos and so on. But suddenly they were able to have the entire photo life in the cloud, which was not even possible before unless you were willing to wait an entire month for them to upload. Right, right. And Google Photos does exactly that today. They optimize your photos. They don't tell you how, but by default with the free tier, they cap to 16 megapixels and they optimize the photo, which means recompressing. And um, so it's, it's going to be the standard because it's not... It's not really scalable otherwise in terms of storage cost and so on. So we, we suddenly did pioneer a number of, uh, of ideas. And as a matter of fact, Google Photo released uh, in a few days ago something, the equivalent of Flashback Excel. They call that uh, photos to this day, or I don't remember exactly how they phrase it, but it's exactly what Flashback was doing um, with Everpix, you know, at Everpix. So we were definitely on the right track for a number of these things. And um, that doesn't mean it would necessarily have been a massive success on a thing like that, because there are a ton of other factors. Um, but it's, it's at least that's a good outcome that um, we did um, understand where things were going and had uh, built the right insight as a team, right? And managed to execute on a lot of that. So that was a really good experience and people are very happy with the outcome, even though it's a bittersweet outcome for obvious reasons. It's clear to see that you're a pioneer. That's for sure. I mean, I, I mean, I'd love, love, love to dive deeper into Everpix, but I do want to move on here in a minute mm -hmm. to, to some other topics. But just, of course. To, just to tap on that topic just a bit is I feel like you've been a pioneer in so many different ways. And what I gathered, and hopefully the listeners may have gathered this too, and um, you know, on Twitter, or if you're a member in member chat on Slack, uh, chime into this, but as you're listening, but, um, I'm thinking like there's a separation between technology and product, right? Mm -hmm. Like from a technology standpoint, we're kicking some major butt and also on a product side, because you had 12%, whereas others had 3% subscription rate, you know, mm -hmm. on the free tier, but mm -hmm. there's a, there's a separation of, of advancement in technology, which clearly you're good at. And there's an advancement on on uh, product, which is what investors are actually investing in, right? Mm -hmm. They don't always see technology, and they're not always excited about technology. They're excited about product 
and sales and millions and metrics and and yes. money and revenue. Th- right? That's where where the big money is. It's, right. it's really on technology, only on technology. I mean, it does happen, of course, but it's often you have to package it into a product and to solve a problem someone has. Well, this is episode 172. For so for those listening out there, we do have a link to the Everpix Intelligence GitHub repo. Everpix, E-V-E, uh, E-V-E-R-P-I-X is the GitHub user or sorry, the GitHub org. Um, so we'll have links to that. We'll have links to the Verge article that uh, that you've mentioned, Pierre. And we'll also link out. I kind of like even the sparse Everpix.com site. <laughs> And I think it's kind of neat. I, I think this is a really graceful, beautiful way to to fail, I guess, and not in a bad way, but like you know, hit an end of a road, and uh, and leave the the community, the the consumers, whomever might come after it, with uh, a link to a, a very clear story from the Verge, and also all this business data on GitHub. I, I think that's a mm-hmm. really classy way to do it, and I commend you on that. Um, let's let's go ahead and take this opportunity to to give one more pause. Hear from an awesome sponsor. When we come back, we're going to dive deep into the heart of this conversation, which is Git UX, Git Up, this mm-hmm. cool new tool that hopefully it seems like, you know, it's your future. We'll see what you say, but let's take a break. When we come back, we'll dive deep into that. So here we come back. Century is logging the way it should be. A brand new sponsor here at the Change Log. We met these guys at GopherCon. Love what they're doing. They're dog fooding their own product and they're doing some awesome stuff. Well, Sentry is a real-time error logging platform that gives you the insight you need into the errors that affect your customers. They surface your errors, helps you gauge severity and frequency, and then gives you the information you need to get them fixed. It works on nearly every platform, including JavaScript, Ruby, iOS, Go, Python, and many more. And the best part is Sentry is open source. You can install and host it yourself, or you can make your life easier and start a hosted plan at GetSentry.com. Once again, that's GetSentry.com. All right, we're still here with Pierre. Uh, Pierre, I feel like I can call you a brother, man. Like <laughs> I, I feel like I've learned every bit of history I could from you, and I thank you so much for this uh, this deep dive into your history. I mean, everything from you as a toddler next to an Apple computer uh, all the way to your history through Apple being there when Steve Jobs announced the iPhone and the SDK, SDK that uh, all the engineers were surprised mm-hmm. by, on through to uh, creating a startup and and sadly failing at it, uh, mm-hmm. but in a graceful way. Now, what you're doing? What are you doing now? I, I'm assuming what you're doing, but what what are you doing now? Um, yeah. So after Everpix, you know, I worked for um, uh, um, a car actually startup. So yet another. Um, still related to software, of course, but um, a different space within software uh, called Automatic, which is uh, building extremely interesting uh, devices that you plug in your car and the whole platform behind it to get the the metrics and the, uh, and the real time data and do analysis on that and help you become a little dri- uh, a better driver, sorry, and so on. So there's um, that's a big deal because cars are not connected to the cloud as of today or barely, and so these are computers on wheels that are not tapped into into internet and there's so many things you can do there and so that startup is tackling that that big space uh, problem big opportunity problem and um, so I worked there for some time um, helped them with engineering this sort of things uh, product and all of this and then um, then for personal reason um, I, I quit and um, because uh, like I was saying, for um, on a personal level, you know, we were going to have our first uh, child, and I wanted to uh, take a bit of time off before that with my wife, travel a little more, like this sort of things, and then, uh, um, and then be, you know, having certain peace of mind when uh, when she was born, etc. Uh, but that said, I have a problem in the sense that it's very difficult for me to to stay idle, and so I always poke around with things and look at projects and this and that. And uh, one thing that did puzzle me for some time. Um, both as an engineer and as a, a manager, is the is Git, which which is fascinating because it is the standard, obviously, to do today to do uh, version control systems, and it has won the war for the time being until something better comes, which is probably going to be five ten years away at least. And um, so it's it's pervasive. 
but it's it's tough for a lot of engineers. Uh, they really have problems with kids. Um, p- engineers who might be junior or engineers who might be very senior and they get stuck on these things because the the way you interact with Git is very puzzling to say yes. the least. Um, you want to do a certain operation, it's one command. You want to do the exact same operation, but with a slightly different variation. And it's complete, a completely different command. Or things are not symmetrical. Or it's, it's weird. It's really strange. And so you have to build muscle memory. And it takes some time. And if you don't use Git for, you know, a few months or whatever, you might forget, how do I do again this, this specific thing I want to achieve? And then you don't remember. And so... To me, Git is kind of the, the, the Stack Overflow uh, version control system because what people do in practice is, apart from doing a commit uh, and pushing and maybe fetching, every time they want to do something a tiny bit more advanced, you go to Stack Overflow, you enter your query, and so on. And so that's, that's a fact. The, among the five, Stack Overflow is obviously the, the, um, the one place where programmer exchange knowledge uh, in the entire world by far. And so it is very representative, in my opinion, of the state of things. And so the, among the five most voted questions of all time on Stack Overflow, three are Git questions for yeah. basic stuff, like how do I edit a commit message? How do I undo a commit or this sort of things? Really, really basic. And I think it's clear by this time, the people behind Git, truly owning Git, right, the Git project, um, are not going to tackle this. Um, they add, um, when you type a command and it's not very clear what it does or it's a bit confusing, they add various prompts and guides and help to tell you maybe you mean this or if you want to cancel this operation you just did, enter this command. But they're not going to touch the way it works and rename the commands, for example, and do a clean pass and make it uh, a lot more consistent in terms of uh, what the verbs are and how they work and the options and all of these things. And uh, Mercurial is a lot more consistent in that aspect, for instance. Um, and so I, I understand it, if you were to do something like that, not only do you need the right people to build a new, a new type of command line interface, um, but you need to deal with breaking in a way the compatibility with everything else. And so it's um, I certainly don't don't throw the stone at them for not tackling a challenge like that. Um, but the fact remains that this is far from an ideal situation. And uh, there's a lot of wasted time from my observation with Git. Um, and that results in lost productivity for engineers. And that results in frustration. And that results in having typically in the team, you know, one person who's very good at, the, at Git. And everyone's going to bo- go bother that person every time there's a problem, and which is often. And so, um, to me, this is frustrating. And like I was thinking, uh, we should do something better in the way to interact with Git. And so, um, I figured, you know, the way, what's very interesting with, with Git is that the, the, um, the way people tackle a problem when they're stuck in the repository is they ask that person who knows Git on the team. And that person is very often going to go on a whiteboard and draw the thing, the state of thing, the branches and say, yeah. you are here and you're trying to do this. So you need to do this operation, so you can do that, and then that other operation and so on. And you see what I mean? And and then the person go, you know, do it, applying the commands and it works like, okay, that's cool. And then the next day the same thing happens and cannot possibly remember anyway because the commands are so esoteric. So back to square one. But the point is, it's about a visual representation. And so, of course, every Git client comes with, you know, little branches on the side next to the list of commit that shows you roughly what's happening and so on. And, um, but that's that's not the same. Um, so my idea was, okay, um, Instead of manipulating commits per se, let's manipulate a graph. So you see the graph of the repository, which is its topology, right? And how the commits are related and the branches and all of that. And if I want to delete a commit, I select the commit and I hit delete and it works. If I want to edit a commit message, I click on the commit and I somehow trigger an edit option and edit the commit message and it works. Um, if I want to do a rebase, I can see visually what's happening. If I want to do a merge, I understand it, you know, those sort of things. And it's a lot more intuitive because you see the branches, um, you see what is happening before and after and so on. And so I figured, um, well, that would probably work. I guess that would work. Um, I should try to build that thing. And um, it should make it a lot easier because the number of times 
on my own personal project, I ended up in a frustrating situation where I know exactly what I want to do with Git in terms of merging this there and rebasing and whatnot. And I have to then decompose the result into all these command line operations where it would be so easy to just have the graph, click on the commit in question and do that thing. Yeah, so much of Git's magic and beauty is hidden behind a... Um, uh, I, I don't want to say just just complicated, but in some ways, just very a mysterious way of doing things it from is. the command line. It, it is, and um, I want to be very clear on one thing, which on one thing, which is the Git architecture and design is extremely elegant. It's very simple and extremely elegant. The way the references work, the way the commit are done, the trees, all of that, the database format, like it's it's designed to be, it's one of these technologies where the beauty is it's in simplicity and that's why it's it's really successful and pervasive, uh, despite, you know, the terrible command line interface. And then the existing Mac apps uh, can come on, a win well, actually Windows apps, pretty much the same state of things, but um, the existing uh, guy clients, what they do is they take the command line interface and they just wrap it anyway, which means you take the clunkiness of the command line interface and then you wrap it into a bunch of dialogues and you expose every possible option and and you put some nice polish on top of this and make it look clean. But that's really lipstick on a pig to be brutal. It's not solving anything, <laughs> you yeah. know? And and you're, you're just compounding problems. Now, not only do you have the clean inefficiency because of the way it's, it's designed and then you have all these dialogues and checkboxes and things. And sometimes you look at these clients and they ask you a question, do you want to enable this option when you do this operation? And you don't even understand what the heck this means. Um, Cause it's not using Git proper terms and it's not clear either. I mean, so to me it was, it was just not solved. And so that's why um, I started working on, on building this concept, this uh, proof of concept, if you wish. And uh, there is a really, really good um, open source project called libgit2, and it's a C implementation of core Git, um, because Git itself is not designed as a library you can embed. It's a bunch of, it's a bit of C code and a bunch of shell script on top of that, and it's not really designed to be to be used by, um, you know, all apps embedding it. And so libgit2 is a C API and everything. It's very clean. It doesn't do everything, but uh, it does a number of things pretty well and provides a great uh, foundation to build on top of that. And so um, GitHub is built entirely on top of a subset, actually, of libgit2, where I just use libgit2 for, say, uh, commit parsing and and uh, um, the merge engine and, and the diff engine and this sort of things. And uh, But everything else is rebuilt on top of that subset, uh, which gives me uh, a much better... Um, I would say consistency in the way things work because libgit2 is an open source project that's been going on for a few years. So it's not um, it, it's not truly spec if you see what I mean. So right. you have some parts that work a certain way, some other parts that work slightly differently, and, and some things that should really be subclasses of other things uh, from a, a hierarchy perspective, actually not, and and so on and so on. And it has a few esoteric things and some little edge case bugs, et cetera, et cetera. So you you really need an abstraction layer, in my opinion. And so that, you know, the the GitHub Kit, in a way, or that's what I called it, um, is is this. It takes a subset that's very solid of libgit2 and then rebuild everything on top of it in terms of Git functionality from from checkout to, uh, mer to, to merging branches and all of that on top of this subset, uh, and then add a bunch of layers to do... Um, unique features like unlimited under redo, which no other Git client has, to um, you know, snapshots with like time machine for a Git repo, which is very, very cool and life-saving. Um, and and other features like um splitting commits uh just without touching any file on this. Just select a commit, you can split the commit and the lines between these these files like in a completely fluid way and then just commit the result and that's done or um, you know unified ref log and a bunch of things uh, that become suddenly buildable because you have the right foundation there and you're not limited by the binary git tool that you're trying to wrap you just use you just deal with the git database directly and then enable a gazillion things mm, um, yeah that's and a, so that's it's, a big deal it's there. built yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounds simple when you describe yeah, deal with it like the database that. Database directly is a big deal, I think. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And, that's and, a key and, word um, there. So it doesn't try to call the command line. It doesn't. I mean, Git up works even if you don't have Git installed at all. It doesn't right. use Git. It doesn't touch it. it. Doesn't mess with your config settings. It doesn't. It's a very, very safe app. Uh, and now that it's entirely open source, you can see how it's done. So you can have even more trust in a way. Um, and so the, 
um, GitHub is was a bet in terms of saying, what if you write a Git client that is dealing directly with the database, not adding the overhead of going through the Git command line interface and the clunkiness, and has uh, an interface that lets you manipulate directly the topology of the repository, right? Um, that makes it, would that make it a lot easier to do all these common operations and people understanding what is happening? And of course, you know, the whole thing has unlimited undo redo, like I said, and it's built modern, right? And it's completely live. So you can work in a common line tool alongside uh, GitHub, and then your changes so show in the graph within like one second latency. Right, you can use them. You can use the two in parallel. And in fact, you can sort you, of like you are. That's so. That's a very important point that you raise. With I would consider myself a Git power user, and I the last thing I would want is um, you know a play school type of app. Um, it is not what it's about. It's a tool done for professional Git users that is as fast, if not faster, than the command line. If you do a rebase in GitHub, it's actually very often quite faster than the command line. And um, and um, it's faster than the command line, very reliable, and it just gets out of the way at the same time, and it doesn't force you to adopt the whole thing. It's not a full buying experience. So you can use... GitHub purely as a viewer of your graph. So if you use the command line all the time, you open the window next to your terminal, you can see what's happening in real time in your repo, you do your operations, and you can verify at a glance that you're doing it right. And if you did it wrong, go to GitHub and roll back to the previous step just by using a snapshot. The whole yeah. thing is, you know, it's very friendly. You can use it as little as you want to as much as you want. Um, and I also spent a lot of time on building the, designing a commit view for, for um, GitHub. And... The I really wanted a commit view that was faster um, than the command line. And so I spent a lot of time figuring out a good layout, taking obviously inspiration from um, existing clients and whatnot, but also making it very fluid in terms of it's completely keyboard driven. So you can very fast select lines and press return and stage them. And then option returns commit the whole thing. And it sounds simple like that, but it's, it's really fast um, in terms of, of workflow. And um, if you look at the at the feedback on Twitter, I guess that's the primary channel for that. But GitHub, it's uh, uh, it's been really really positive because a number of people realize, oh, uh, it's really fast and it gets out of the way, and that's pretty neat. And it gives them a little more comfort the fact they can see all these things visually. And of course, it's not a tool that lets you do every possible thing in Git, but um, it should cover the vast majority of of uh, usage scenarios and. Uh, and let you switch to it if you want to, or as like I said earlier, as much as you want. It's pretty neat. You can or even start also using... the more complex operations where yes. you're like, man, I gotta Google that again. Going back to yeah, like um, you don't have to worry about that or something. If you, exactly, you want to edit a commit message, you select the commit, you type e, edit the message, return you done. I mean, yeah. it's like it beats everything else. Like it's a so faster than the command line. There's nothing. Um, and and um, so that that's very different. Uh, like I said, it, it was a bet in terms of user interface, uh, in tech to an extent how it was built. Um, so I realized it. I think publicly slowly, uh, at the beginning of the year, if I'm not mistaken. It took quite a time to write. There was a lot of code. Um, GitHub, if you look at the source code, is about thirty thousand lines of code, first party code, uh, which means um, you know I mean I'm not counting third party libraries and any of this. It just code written for the app exclusively. Um, it's significant. Like there's a ton of things to write in terms of foundation layer and technology stack and all of that stuff to manipulate the commits and build the undo redo system properly and an atomic transform of the repository references and whatnot. So um, a lot of experiment back and forth, a lot of time making the graph very fast. It's, it is, GitHub is not designed, you know, that's one of the things where it, it has clear limitations. Um, if you try to use GitHub on a massive repo, which means repo with like hundreds of thousands of commits and dozens of thousands of branches and 80,000 files or whatever uh, per tree, it's, it will be slow. It is absolutely not designed for that. Um, I designed the app for, um, w for the typical repo and uh, with a, a usual like an order of magnitude margin, which is usually how I do technologies, meaning if people... Uh, have, like in the case of Aeropix, the average photo collection is 10,000. Okay, well, we're going to design a technology and our stack to handle 100,000. And that gives us plenty of margin and we're fine. And so 
Yes, and someone who comes in and has a million photos is not going to work that well. Although yeah. at Everpix, we did have someone with 700,000 photos, and it worked fine, and, and a few extreme cases like that. Um, but still, so that sounds sweet the vast majority, yeah, yeah, it's fine. So, you know, a basic rule there, um, we, we learned actually discovered in a way, but uh, we're obviously not the first ones at um, well building Everpix was, you just look at the distribution, um, and, and you take, you say, I'm going to shoot for the 75th percentile, and that's it. So... I can tell you that from the data I gathered and everything, that the 75th percentile of repos is definitely around a few thousand commits, uh, less than 10,000 for sure. And so by far. And so um, you build an app that can handle 100,000 commits, which is what GitHub is. And, you know, the, the 75th percentile of branches is going to be maybe 100 at most. I don't remember the exact number at the top of my head, but it's not like thousands. And so, again, if you have a repo... Uh, with a few thousand branches, they're going to start getting slow at a few places, and and so on and so on. So it was designed to be really, really, really fast for the 75th percentile of repos, which is the vast majority of them. And um, and and um, that was released early this year. Um, I think it got to the the top on Hacker News, and then was featured by uh, Product Hunt and things like that. When it got um, a little bit more mature, yeah, uh, people were intrigued by it and so on because it was definitely a departure. Um, and it, you know, a certain category of people, I can't, it, I don't, it's a bit tricky to measure the adoption. Um, I have a rough idea of the number of downloads. It's around, last time I checked around 50,000, 50, 80, I mean, it's more than 50,000, but I don't know exactly because it's with caching and CDN and all of that. Uh, I only have like a, a baseline and, um, but it's not a million, right? And, um, uh, yeah, it has definitely, uh, thousands of, um, active users for sure at the bare minimum and, and a very good um, feedback on Twitter that resonated to a certain category of, of, um, of Git users for sure. Um, I don't know where the project's going to go in terms of um, adoption. You know, is that going to be a big thing? Is that going to kind of find its sweet spot and remain at a, a, a user base of dozens of thousands or something like that and, uh, or go bigger? It's, it's very, very difficult to say. Um, um, but we'll see, you know, it's, uh, I'm pretty happy with where it's at. Um, I got help um, in terms of design and some of the user interface um, with uh, Wen Fan, who was my, my co-founder at Everpix and designer. Um, and I also work with um, uh, Jason Eberle, who was my, um, who was our web engineer at the time with Everpix and he helped with some of the website and all of that. So it was a bit of a collaborative process, but not as much as something like Everpix of all the projects that work on because it was a, still a very personal project when I've done the, the vast majority of the, the coding and stuff. Um, as like I said, first of all, um, as an experiment, but also really a tool that I wanted to have for myself, a way of dealing with Git repositories. On a side note of mentioning Jason, uh, it's kind mm -hmm. of funny because... We don't do the reads for our sponsors live when we actually do this show recorded with you. But Imagix was actually a sponsor mm -hmm. of the show, and Jason works at Imagix and Absolutely, was yes. a contributor to the Imagix.js library, which helps uh, those repository. You know, that, that's a, a library there to work with the Imagix API to mm -hmm. allow your app or site to uh, to work with the Imagix API and and deal with responsiveness on your on your app or your your site. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of interesting. And, yeah, well, you know that's one of the thing you um, you have in the, in the Silicon Valley as a whole is it is a small world. Yeah. Um, it sounds like cliche when you say that, and you don't necessarily believe it when you when you <laughs> arrive because it takes a long time to build connections unless you're at the right time at the right place, right? But well, that's totally by happenstance too, that Jason was part of this. And when I was doing my research, I'm like, ah, that's cool. Jason, Jason was a part of this. Yeah. And I meet people, you know, and it's always, you, you end up meeting people you met years back again in under completely different circumstances. And you realize people are, you, you know, there is this, 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 um, mathematical proof that people are only six degrees away or seven. I don't remember, but you know, Silicon Valley, I'm suspecting it's like two, because you always end up talking to people who are one degree away yes. from uh, people you know and this sort of things. There's there's really an ecosystem there. It's um, it's fascinating. And Pierre, that's exactly why I thought it would be interesting to like uh, this show is probably a little bit different than our normal shows, but just dive deep into our guest past because I think it paints a really unique position to get up and what you're doing with it because of your history in software development, like everything from all the history we painted during this show to, to now, 
that this is your interest. You know, so given the success that you've had in the past, given the bets, as you said, on technology, um, I feel like it was really important to sort of dig deep into your past to, to really get an idea of, of how serious to take it up, mm-hmm. you know, cause sure there's Git tools out there that promise things like, uh, the Git interface you've been missing all your life has finally arrived. That's what you say for Git up. Right. And, and a lot of, a lot of people could promise that, but you've got the history to say that you can truly make that statement for Git up. And the fact that you've got, um, let me go back to my notes here. The Git up kit um, yes. piece that sits mm-hmm. on top of this that interacts directly with the Git, yeah. the mm-hmm. Git database. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that you're taking some really unique approaches towards solving this problem. And maybe you're not far enough now. So for the listeners out there thinking, ah, this is a pretty, you know, a, a good UI. I love how it works. They could use some work. Well, you just started in November, you know, so it's not like mm-hmm. you've been doing this for a very, very long time. Yes, it's a it's a very young product. I mean, right. absolutely. And uh, but it it has the it implements the concept I had in mind to a truthful degree um, in terms of user inter- user uh, experience and how it's built. And yes, it's not you know this is in terms of of complexity, in terms of engineering and whatnot. This is like one two orders of, of magnitude smaller than something like Everpix, of course, and or, or Quartz Composer and whatnot. Um, but, you know, it's through the years, obviously, um, like in any trade, you, you learn and you learn how to do things better and more efficiently and so on. So GitHub is, yes, I apply um, a lot of years of learning in terms of software development and all of this. So it is much better code and architecture than what I would have done, you know, 10 years ago, etc. So some of that uh, hopefully does reflect in the way it works and, and um, the way it's built. And, um, but it is, um, yeah, it is hopefully going to help that's also why I figured, you know, open source is probably the best for that. I was debating for some time, is that a product you can build um, a sustainable business around it and so on? And there are some examples, so it is doable, uh, but what's going to be the scale of it and so on? And it's something where um, I did it, you know, selfishly for me, obviously, first, because I wanted to have something I would qualify better, at least for my pattern of work, uh, my workflow uh, with Git, and then uh, figure out, well, Okay, it helps other people, interests other people. Can you make a business out of that? How many people is that going to be? And then you weight that against the amount of work that's needed and, and support and all these other things that come along and, and opportunity cost, etc. And I figured, you know, I like the product how it is. I'm going to keep working on it, but I want to do that in my spare time without pressure because I'm pretty happy with it. So um, open source is probably the best because uh, it lets it gives... It's an active open source project. It gives a degree of confidence to people that they can use the app because uh, it is open source and you, you check it out and you build it and you run it on your own. So it's not going to go away and disappear. And um, and you can judge yourself uh, how well it's built or not according to your opinion and you can customize it and all of that to a reasonable degree. And the um, and, and, and for free, it comes with this thing that I called... Um, very innovative, innovatively, you could say, a GitHub kit uh, to rapidly find a name, right? So, uh, which is just all the pieces to make your own GitHub. And and if you look at the repository, there are a couple examples in there uh, that show in um, in a few lines of code, really like 20, less than 100 lines of code. So how to build like two little um, Git clients uh, that leverages all the power of the pieces that GitHub has in terms of undo, redo, in terms of um, it has its own text, def, uh, sorry, def rendering uh, engine um, based on Cortex for speed. Like a lot of uh, a lot of work went into performance. Um, the def rendering is very fast because it's directly on top of Cortex, for instance, um, and and that makes a difference when you deal with uh, reasonably large diff and you scroll through them. Like all these sort of things, it's um, quite faster than alternative uh, Git clients in a number of places, and because uh, to me that was. You know, it, it's always satisfying, of course, to make things go faster. Um, but it was also required because you want the tool to get out of the way. You don't want to have to wait for it. That's and the I'll give point. you an example there. Well, yes, but um, I go far with that. I'll give you an example. Um, the There are a number of dialogues, right? Model dialogues in GitHub. It's like if you say, I want to create a branch, it needs to prompt you for a branch name. Now, every possible Mac app is going to show you a dialogue where you enter that branch name or uh, so that it looks proper in terms of UX, you know, um, 
sheet that falls down off the top of the window, right? The title bar. These sheets take, I, the animation is like half a second to a second, whatever. By the time the thing is actually on screen, you can start typing. It's not too far from a second. And so to me, this is, this is friction that brings nothing. And then you need to wait another half a second or so for the, the sheet to just close. And um, so if you look at GitHub, the model dialogues are actually completely custom. Um, so they're in line in a way. So if you type uh, B to create a branch or E to edit a commit, you have a in in line view uh, in the map that appears instantly without any animation, and you type directly there, and you hit return, and you're done. So it's in and out extremely fast. Uh, to me, that was that's a small thing, but it's uh, it's representative of uh, the philosophy the in terms of user interface yeah. behind GitHub. It's like get you want it to get out of the way. Really, it's like. Go do your operation, spend and immediately get it. You get it wrong, you can undo, you can redo, and then go back to your code. This is where you should be spending time, right? Creating things, building things, not fighting Git, um, which is which is the case for an unfortunate number of of, of engineers. Um, and so, um, of course, some very advanced people do not need anything like this, or uh, do not won't see the point. Or some other people uh, would prefer a very polished interface. Like GitHub is still a pretty rough interface because I did not put time into. Um, it's clean, but it's not polished in the sense that it doesn't have like nice, um, uh, very polished icons and and um, um, you know pixel perfect things all over the place. Like it's it's pretty much flat, plain colors and so on. Because I put function over form there. And um, there's definitely room to do a pass to make it up to par with uh, what you would expect from a modern Mac app in terms of, of you know, Polish in the UI layer. Um, but that cannot come at the expense of the UX, which is the speed and, and the intuitiveness. So yeah, there, there is room for things there. And some, uh, some people might definitely prefer something that's more Polish even if it's slower because it's, it makes them feel uh, more comfortable or more Mac-like app and so on. Um, so it's not for everyone. I would certainly not pretend that, but um, it has found its um, market fit so far um, for certain user base. And so we'll see where that goes from here. So it's, it's open source. And I guess anybody who may fork it and contribute back Mm -hmm. needs to know that it's GPL version 3, so anything mm -hmm. you contribute, um, for one, it's being used by a lot of people, So, uh, which is a, a notice you give in the README. Uh, it's being used by a lot of people, so keep in mind that any contribution you make is you know can't be breaking. Um, and then that also any work you contribute is GPL version 3. Um, I think it was kind of interesting for us because we run a email that we ship out nightly, so every single night... We are shipping out top star repositories and mm -hmm. basically the, um, you know, the things that are happening on GitHub. Um, it, it, Jared says on steroids, I said on crack uh, the last episode accidentally, but, you know, uh, changelog nightly is essentially what's happening on GitHub every single night. Top star mm -hmm. repositories and uh, GitHub has been on the top star repositories for us on the charts since... August 19th. That's the first time I noticed it. So that was, that was what oh. hit our radar. And mm -hmm. I say that because there's so many people that listen to this podcast and there's so many people that might hear us week to week, talk about change law weekly or change law nightly mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. our open source radar. And in fact, that's where this show came from. And that's where everything you just heard this last hour of me and you talking came from us monitoring mm -hmm. our own emails, you know? So Change all nightly was every bit our open source radar when it came to finding GitHub, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. finding you, diving deep into your history. Um, and I think it's interesting also that um, just your history and what you've done for software so far and the fact that Git is your next focus, I'm kind of encouraged by it because I'm expecting big things from GitHub. Um I think it's interesting that you also have the GitHub Kit framework where anybody out there listening could go and build their very own Git UI on top of this. Now, I didn't see that the GitHub Kit had its own repo. Is there a plan to break that off into its own repo anytime soon? No, not at this point. I mean, um, I'm always wary of moving things around for the sake of moving them around or splitting things and whatnot. Um, it's not at this point. I mean, if it becomes like, ridiculously popular or something like that, then it might make sense. 
but today, I mean, there would not really be any benefit except now you have two repos, you have to look for things in two places and you have dependencies and submodules or subtrees and all of this. It's like, there's no real benefit, honestly. Um, but the, yeah, the GitHub kit is kind of a fun thing. It's like, well, guess what? You don't like uh, how the, the commit view is structuring in, uh, in GitHub? Well, you can build your own. And, and it's not uh, rhetorical, you know? Um, you know, it's often like that with open source projects where people say, well, you can always go and modify it. Yes, but sometimes it's pretty hard to get in. And GitHub Kit is, is designed as, as a multi-layer thing where you have some very low-level components and then you have medium-level components built on the lower-level ones and then you have high-level components. So you can just use the component at the level you want. If all you want is a, a div view that display or stash view that display all the stashes and it's all live and everything, just want to put that in some UI for your Git repo, that it's, it is uh, literally a few lines of code because it's just UI, um, I mean, uh, GI uh, stash view controller and just instantiate that, add it to your window, add the view to your window and you're done. And it's all live and it works and everything. Um, uh, but if you want to dive way lower and say, I want to, you just use the diff um, rendering uh, component. Well, there's a view called uh, GI raw diff view, and that's the low level, lowest level thing. It just renders the diff within a view, and then you have to put it in your own scroll view to scroll and all of these things. And and um, and so that's that's a very um, flexible approach where uh, you can just yeah rearrange some high level views or, or dive as low as you want. And so the two examples that come in the repository in the examples folder show uh, some of that. Uh, they use different levels. Of, of GitHub Kit to, to demonstrate uh, mini apps you can build with. And uh, GitHub Kit actually has some uh, directory inside of GitHub, so it's easy yes, to, to yes, sort yes, of yes. dive deep into that code if you want to. It's not obscure, yeah, it's, it's not there. hidden, mm -hmm, it's easy mm -hmm. to find. You know, the only question I have, I guess, turning uh, towards the close of the show, um, and this is, you know, not prompted from the feedback I got from you on this show, but but beforehand, so some, some assumptions come from this question. Um, and that question is, will this and this being GitHub, will this turn into a paid product or will it remain free? Will it remain open source? What is the stage? What is the plan for this? Um, it will remain open source. I, I cannot imagine a reason why it would change. I, I have a number of uh, projects that are open source. And, and to me, it's a philosophical commitment when you do that. Uh, I've never turned an open source project into a closed source one. Um, I have open source projects that are actually paid. Um, I mean, sorry, that that uh, are sold or have in-app purchase, like Comic Flow is one, and it's entirely open source. So if you don't want to pay for it, you can always download it and build it yourself, uh, as well as a couple of Mac apps on the Mac App Store and so on. Uh, these two are not, however, incompatible. But today, I don't see, I don't see um, a reason to monetize GitHub right now or uh, you know, in a way that that would be um, not be artificial. Um, the comic flow was uh, an app that's quite popular on iPad to read comics and exists, like I mentioned, or, um, has been existing for a few years. Uh, was free for a long time because I built it for myself and I figured, well, maybe it's going to help some people, and that's it. Um, at some point, however, uh, it gained quite a bit of traction and. I rewrote a big section of it, um, all the web server stuff, uh, which was a core component of the app so that you can, you know, connect to your iPad, running a web server and upload files. And it has WebDAV and an interface, so you can do it from your browser as well if you don't want to use WebDAV client. Um, it was a significant piece of work. And um, uh, that became a separate project, it was called a GCD web server, which is probably now the most popular um, web server for iOS and Mac apps. And um, um, and it's open source and it's BSD or something equivalent, so not even GPL, it's all good. And, uh, but I figured, you know, that's a lot of work, so I'm going to make it that, um, make that, sorry, an in-app purchase. And it was, I think it's $3 or $4, I don't recall. And so, uh, but there was, there was a real, um, it was a much better web server than before. And the entire app is completely usable without buying this thing. Uh, you just copy the comics using iTunes directly or through Dropbox or something like that. So it's not crippled where, uh, and it's just uh, a little enhancement that makes your life a bit easier, and then it's an in-app purchase. So maybe something like that will happen one day for GitHub, um, but it, there's nothing like this on the roadmap whatsoever at this point. 
All right. Well, we're uh, we're definitely coming cl- to the close of the show. We have a couple questions. I'm only going to ask one. Uh, I know mm-hmm. I gave you four different options, but we're going to ask one. Um, I, I think this one is is going to resonate a lot with the listeners, which is if they've listened to your thoughts on you know everything through your history on now to get up and to get get up kit and what you're doing with that. You know what is a what we call a call to arms. You know what is if you have the ear, the listenership of the entire open source world right now, mm-hmm. and you wanted to say, hey, this is what I'm working on. If you're interested in this, here's how you can contribute. What would that be for GitHub? Mm, I think it would be um, come explore um, and try out an experiment to change the way people interact with Git. And um, See if it fits for you and make it become being by continuing to iterate on the initial concept. And and I think it would be it would be like this, really. To me, it's still an experiment in a way. I mean, if it were to reach a, a large uh, user base, then the experiment is valid, is validated. Um, it is validated right now to an extent because it has a user base, but it's not validated at scale. And um, uh, yeah, it's so that's why I define it still as an experiment, because there's nothing else like this. It's the, it's a completely unique way of interacting with your Git repo. Uh, there is no client that does this uh, from the way it's built to the way it it actually uh, it's used. I can remember um, talking to I'm trying to remember it was Tim Caswell, I believe, and he. If you go back in our archive, I'm gonna find. I can't recall it right now, but I'm just gonna talk about it quickly. There's an there's an episode. It was the most recent episode because we've had Tim on the show a couple of times, where he was talking about a uh, a Chromebook app that he was building that worked with uh, building basically a better IDE for um, for for Git and software development, a better code editor basically. And it mm-hmm. was it was editing the Git database directly. And the conversation we had reminded me a lot of Tim Caswell's work. So I, I wouldn't doubt that Tim's done some things or is doing some things or has some interest in what you're doing. So it'd be kind of interesting to see if you guys end up collaborating somehow. Um, big fan yeah, of Tim and his work. But um, yeah, man, I mean, it was such a great time to have you on this on this show uh, to just dive deep into your history. And I think yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you. What, what you're working on is is very, very interesting. So for those listening... Um, GitHub is also a repo, but it's also a web address. So if you go to git, G-I-T, up, dot C-O, you'll, uh, you'll find a website with a 90-second video that encourages you to try GitHub for free. This is open source. It's free. Uh, this 90-second screencast kind of goes through some three core features of GitHub that, that everybody really uh, has questions on, which is, editing incorrect commit messages. Who doesn't do that? Like you said, it's the number two stack overflow question of all time. Undo, redo. I wish every single day I, I had undo and redo on Git and also snapshots. And then also articulating perfect commits because the UI is uncluttered. You're able to highlight certain lines of code you'd like to commit and stage. And it's really, really interesting. So if you're if you're out there and you're listening to this, go to getup.co. There's a, a nice little map there. And then down at the very, very bottom of the page, there is a, a button that says download latest release. And uh, maybe you could speak quickly to this, which is this right now. And obviously you're a Mac developer. You've been, mm-hmm. you, you've said this the whole show, not a Windows developer. Any plans to make this available for those Windows folks or Linux folks or anybody else besides those who are blessed to use an Apple product? Um, I... Not personal plans, um, but obviously, you know, the concepts are not rocket science. Right. And so uh, if they catch on and, and get good traction on the Mac, then um, I can certainly imagine there's going to be some uh, uh, some iteration on the ideas on other platform. Uh, GitHub itself is not in practice portable. You know, it's it's like I was saying earlier, it's about 30,000 lines of Objective-C code. Uh, highly, well, except the lower level uh, highly tied to the way the Mac UI works and core graphics and all these things for the rendering and Cortex and a bunch of things. So it's it's one of these things where it would probably take as much to rewrite it from scratch and trying to port it. Um, and so it's not it's not going to happen on on Windows, unfortunately. It was not intended to be built as um, as a cross-platform app using a toolkit like um, 
QTK to this sort of things, it's um, it would not have made uh, GitHub possible as a matter of fact, I think, because it's a really a performance sensitive app uh, when you use it. And, you know, all these little things matter. And so you really have to sit on top of the the native on top of the metal, right? The, right. the lowest, the low level graphic API to, uh, you know, if you draw a graph with um, 10 branches and 100 commits, it doesn't matter what technology you use, it's always going to be fast. But if you wanted to handle a graph like, um, like I don't know, the Git repo, 40,000 commits and so on, and everything loaded in memory and rendered and 60 frames per second when you scroll in all possible direction, all of this, it starts to matter. Um, unless you want the GitHub to be only usable if you have like a, a tower with like an octa-core GPU or these sort of things. So, uh, unfortunately, no, no, no plan for a, a Windows version of GitHub as is. Okay, well, I, I figured that uh, that might be the exact answer you'd give, but I had to ask, of course. Mm -hmm. and, and given that this is an experiment, I mean, this is still, like you said, an experimental stage, it makes sense to have that answer. Um, but Pierre, I know this has been a long time to sit here and grill you on your history and get up and all this uh, wealth of software knowledge you share with the world. I thank you. The audience thanks you. The sponsors of this show thank you. Those sponsors are Codeship. Uh, I mentioned earlier Imagix, a new sponsor of ours, DigitalOcean, and another new sponsor of ours, Century. Uh, definitely thank you for your time to, to sit here and chat with us. Um, for those out there listening, you can su subscribe to this show at changelaw.com or on iTunes. We're syndicated through 5x5. Five five. We have an awesome weekly email called Changelaw Weekly and another email called Changelaw Nightly. Uh, you can get both of those respectively at changelaw.com slash weekly or slash nightly. Um, subscribe to those emails if you want to keep on the open source radar as we do. But uh, Pierre, is there any closing thoughts you want to share before we tail off to, to close the show? Um, um, I think I run out of, uh, of things to say at this point. Uh, you've been very thorough in your questions and everything. No, I mean, uh, well, thank you very much for having me. I mean, it was a great experience. Uh, it was, um, my, my first, um, uh, audio podcast, um, as, a, as an interviewee. And so it was really, uh, yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you. No problem at all. Well, we do have a ton of links for show notes. So if you want to learn more about Pete, uh, Pierre, his work, his past, episode 172 go to changelog.com slash 172 we publish all the links all of our notes there so don't feel like you have to pull over or wreck if you're driving or whatever to get the links they're all on the web for you or right there in your in your uh podcast client but uh check that out thank you so much pierre for for joining us and at this time let's uh, let's go ahead and call it an end and and say goodbye so goodbye goodbye